All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. This is going to be episode 26, I believe. I should probably just stop announcing the episode number because I've messed it up several times and it's not really important. But we had a guest scheduled and he ended up having to get rescheduled. So hopefully that episode will be coming out in the following week. But just to keep the show on schedule, I like to release content every Thursday. We've been staying on track this whole time that we since we started the show. I think it's important to uh, maintain that schedule. So what I decided we're going to do today, it's just me. I'm sitting in my house. So if you hear my kids or my dogs, I apologize. But I, like all you guys, do real life as well. So I decided we're just going to do an audio version. And I'm just going to go over some stuff that's been in my mind over the last couple weeks. And probably hash out some of the same stuff that we've talked about in previous shows. But I feel like there's a tipping point and I feel like it's rapidly approaching. And so, you know, I don't want to be the person that's inciting this unrest or pushing the fearful mindset, but at the same time to not be prepared and to not be thinking about it, not have contingencies. I think that is equally as foolish. And so just like everything in life, there's balance. We don't want to be living in fear, 24 seven and be freaked out about the future. But we also want to have a good grasp of what's going on, have an understanding and not be caught off guard if things do go bad. And so, you know, today I had a a, kind of an interesting experience. I have a jujitsu tournament coming up and I've just been feeling really beat up. A lot of injuries that have been plaguing me. My back's hurt. Yesterday I popped a rib and now it, hurts to even laugh. So, uh, my body is not in a good state and obviously that's a huge part of going into a competition. And I've been thinking about having a stronger mindset, having a stronger mentality when it comes to being a competitor. And I'm open about being a competitor. I've competed a fair amount and I've done well sometimes. And then I've done absolutely terrible other times. I've had a lot of bad luck at competition And I think that's probably due to a conglomerate of reasons, but I know some of the best fighters of all time swore by hypnotherapy. They talked about how really honing your mind and focusing on being successful and having a winning mindset and applying that approach to your training and your competition is, is a, creates a huge recipe for success I know Mike Tyson did it. I know George St. Pierre did it. And if it works for guys like that, I'm going to give it a try. That was, that was my mindset going into this competition. I was like, why not give it a try and just kind of see what it does for me. So this morning I scheduled a meeting with a hypnotherapist. It was a place called Anchor Light in Queen Anne Hill in Seattle. And it was phenomenal. The, the therapist that, that walked me through the it's like a guided meditation almost. The, she did a really good job. But one thing that she said to me that was interesting, she said, well, we're talking about you as a competitor. That's what your email said. That's what we talked about on the phone when we, when we scheduled you. But sometimes these, sometimes these sessions turn on their own and they open up other doors and you might be this session might not be about being a competitor. This session might be about some other aspect of your life that you're trying to unpack. And I was open with that. Like I've said on previous episodes, I think being a uh, being open and honest about accepting help from people and attending therapy sessions, it's only been beneficial to me. So there's there's no reason that I should be fearful or shameful or embarrassed to talk about it. Therapy opens up your vulnerabilities which then helps you unpack your trauma. I've felt it myself. I've seen it in my friends. And so I'm open to sharing it on the show because if this, if this content reaches one person that's, that's dealing with some trauma, a veteran or not a veteran, I mean, everybody goes through their, their stuff and they seek help and it helps them, then my words are worth their time. So we started and she asked me different things about what I wanted to get out of the the session. And the, the weird thing about it is, you know, I've never been hypnotized before. And to tell you the truth, I don't even know 
if I was hypnotized, I don't really even know what that means. I mean, she talked me through some breathing exercises and some relaxation techniques, and then she just really started to delve into my mind. But I never felt like I was out of control or not myself or in some kind of trance. I just felt that I was in a position where I could be vulnerable, I could be honest, and I felt comfortable. And we started talking about some of the aspects of being a competitor, some of the aspects of being an athlete. And I started to really understand that I'm in conflict with myself right now. And that was kind of the, uh, that was kind of the overarching theme of this session. There was a lot of conflict within my own soul. And because there's so much conflict in myself, I'm having a hard time putting energy into other things, i.e., the competition. And I walked away from that therapy session realizing like, I, I feel like I have bigger fish to fry right now. And I don't know if it's legitimate or if it's contrived in my mind or a combination of the two, but I feel like right now I'm kind of at a crossroads and there's a part of me that has, I mean, I've been embracing a warrior mindset and a warrior lifestyle since I was 18 years old. I went right into the military and I went volunteered for the Rangers and, and did all that stuff. And if you're listening to this show, I'm sure you probably already know my background and the things that I did and the things I experienced. But there's also a part of me that was ready to kind of drop my rucksack and put that stuff behind me and focus on raising my family and running my jiu-jitsu academy and enjoying the things, the aspects of this life that I really didn't get to enjoy through my 20s. You know, I have a, a really good friend of mine who got into the range regiment about a year before me, and he's still in the army to this day, and he worked his way up to the unit, and that's where he's at now. And one thing he said to me, he's like, Greg, I realized looking back on my life that I gave my entire youth to the war. And that's a, that's a pretty heavy burden to feel like we have this one life and we dedicated so much of it to the war. And, and that's a whole struggle in itself because the war, when I look back on it, I don't feel like I felt when I was 25 going over there we're going to hunt terrorists and we're going to fucking kill people and I can't wait. And I'd rather fight them over there than over here. Like, you know, that was kind of the, the, the mindset of a lot of people because I guess that justified it. And to this day, I don't really know what the right or wrong answer is. I think it's kind of, uh, it's nuanced. Some missions I do think were critical I do think removing ISIS was necessary. Uh, but then again, ISIS was a result of us removing Saddam. And so that's probably above my pay grade to tell you the truth. I mean, I have opinions on it and I was over there and I experienced it firsthand, but there's just a lot of big picture things going on that I don't, I don't know if there is just a cut and dry right or wrong answer. A lot of bad stuff happened. A lot of bad decisions were made. Good people were killed. A lot of civilians were killed. And when I look back on that, I have to ask myself, is the end result of everything that we did, was it, is it beneficial? Was it worth it? And I, I have a hard time being honest with myself and saying, yes, it was, it was absolutely necessary. Because I feel like if we're going to put our, our soldiers and our airmen, our Marines and our sailors in harm's way, I feel like there should be a 100% certainty that we need to engage in this operation or this conflict or this war. And when I look back on that, I just don't feel that. And so now here I am removed 10 years. My last deployment was 2009. And I look back on everything and it makes me want to kind of chase a different, a different goal or a different dream where I do want to be a good father. I want to spend time with my children. I want to have meaningful relationships with people. I want to be in a good relationship with my wife. And these are things that a lot of soldiers struggled with. It's hard to balance those two things. 
And so I felt like there was a period of time that I was doing pretty good at that stuff. You know, I didn't, I didn't foresee any more combat in my future. And I've, I've arrived at a point now where I feel like some type of conflict is imminent. And I literally, uh, this is what we figured out during the therapy session today, that there's literally two sides of this inside my own mind that are in conflict with each other. There's part of me that believes conflict is imminent again. And then there's a part of me that thinks maybe you're just overreacting and you need to chill and you can just enjoy yourself a little more and let your guard down and have fun. Focus on the things that make you feel good. Do the things that make you feel good. And it goes on and on and on. And so on one end of the spectrum, we're simply seeking comfort and pleasures. And if that's the direction you take your life, well, you'll be laying in bed, watching Netflix, eating pepperoni pizzas, and you'll weigh 300 pounds. And it will feel good while you're doing it. It'll feel relaxing while you're doing it. But the end result, as we all know, is not what you want to be as a person because you will turn in to somebody that is gluttonous, lazy, incapable, and unhealthy. And incapable, when I say incapable, incapable of doing the things that are necessary as a parent, as a father, as a protector. So those two lifestyles are not congruent with each other. And it makes me always think about trying to find balance because I should be able to have fun and relax and lay down with my kids and watch movies and eat ice cream. Like all that stuff is good. Right. But the other side of it is now that I feel like something's on the horizon, I feel like I need to be getting ready. I need to be preparing. I need to be building relationships with the right people. I need a comms plan. I need to outfit my truck with more equipment. So I have better mobility, better range. Um, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, you see, I'm building a a second AR 10 right now and, uh, learning how to do that myself. I've never built a, a a weapon. Just, I bought a, a, a stripped lower receiver and I'm putting every part together on my own. And now I'm thinking about more ammo that I need to buy or, or this gun that has better range and on and on and on. And to tell you the truth, it's, it, it becomes exhausting because in my own mind, I have to ask myself, is this a legitimate future that you may potentially be faced with? Or are you almost becoming, are you, are you getting caught up in your own mind on what ifs and possibilities and the, the scary thing is I don't know the answer. And so without having a solid answer that I can provide to myself, I feel like we have to err on the side of preparedness. And, and that's what I've been doing. But with that mindset, with the combat mindset, that things might go bad and we might be fighting on the streets again, It's not that it's fear. Fear is not an emotion that I feel when I think about that future. To tell you the truth, I feel excitement. You know, there's, there's a part of me that thinks this country needs a reset and there's corruption at every single level. And the normal citizens like myself and like most of you guys that listen to this show are fed up. We've had enough. And I just feel like the current trajectory that our country is on is not sustainable. And if I feel that it's not sustainable, what does that mean? That means that something has to give sooner or later. The other thing that we're seeing more and more is that the the divide in this country, it's, it's becoming a Canyon. You know, I, I was just talking to my wife about this, thinking about when McCain ran against Obama. And if you voted for Obama or if you voted for McCain, I don't remember people hating each other over that. I remember it just being a political difference. And and don't get me wrong. I mean, I was raised by a hardcore. My dad was a right-wing conservative, and uh, he hated the Clintons, and he hated the Obamas. And I heard that my whole life. But I also feel like most of society was able to 
communicate and have relationships with each other that crossed political lines. And you may have hated Obama's policies personally, or, or even the other side, you may have, you know, when, when it was like I was saying, McCain versus Obama, regardless of what side you were on, I don't feel like that was a deal breaker for people to get along and maintain friendships. And I just don't think that's the case anymore. You know, with everything that's going on, the world's in a weird place and the two opposing sides, there's no middle ground. There is no middle ground anymore. And with there being no middle ground and us growing farther and farther apart and our ideologies are becoming more and more different, what, what does that mean for our future? And I feel like there has to be a tipping point. Something's going to give. And I think, I think there will be violence at some point. And, you know, I talked about that on the video that got me the, the notoriety in the first place is that the people are fed up with what's going on with the government. And the whole reason I made that video is because I felt if the government kept pushing and kept pushing and trampling on people's rights, their constitutional rights, things that are not up for negotiation, if they continued to do that, at some point, the citizens would rise up and push back. That was the whole point of me making that video because I didn't want to see that. I thought that it could be handled a lot better. Um, I don't want to live, I don't want my kids to live through, uh, you know, a war-torn America and have to rebuild their country and, and, and witness violence and all the things that come with combat. I don't want them to be exposed to that. And so that was my mindset then. And, and that's my mindset now. I don't want them to be exposed to that. But now I'm looking at it a little more objectively and I just don't know if, if there, if there will be another route. Part of me feels like violence is inevitable. And, you know, I was, I was actually reading something online the other day and it's, I came across a post and I'll read it to you guys now. And it just kind of opened my eyes for how divided we are and how different our ideologies are. Um, the mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, who has run that city into the ground. If you live in Seattle or you're familiar with Seattle, the last three years, we have watched that city decay beyond anything you could have thought was imaginable. And she just announced she's not running for re-election. And then Jay Inslee tweeted this out. The governor of Washington tweeted, I thank Mayor Durkin for all she has done for Seattle. Jenny has led through tumultuous times and made difficult decisions with grace and dignity. She was a great partner through the COVID-19 pandemic and helped make Seattle a world-class place to live. And I read that and I'm just fucking flabbergasted that someone could even put that in writing. He has to know how full of shit he is. I, I would think because I live in Seattle. I was down there today. As a matter of fact, leaving this appointment that we'll go back, we'll circle back to. And every time I go down there, there's more tents, more drugs, more filth, more trash. The city is disgusting. The police are as disgruntled as they've ever been. The city council is ran by socialists. And he's saying that she made Seattle a world-class place to live. And I just couldn't even believe I was reading it. So I started, and this is probably my bad. Like I shouldn't give energy to this stuff, but I feel like I have to kind of know my enemy, you know? And so I started reading the comments and people are like, thank you, governor, for keeping us safe. We really appreciate what you and Jenny did. Thank you for um, closing the businesses and making mask mandates. You're saving lives. People that want to keep their businesses open are killing people. And I just realized how out of touch these two sides are with each other. Because I don't know one small business owner that has any intention of making people sick or killing people. I've yet to meet that person. That person doesn't exist, but that's the narrative that's being pushed. So now if you keep your business open, you're trying to murder people. That's, that is what they're pushing on the other side. And, 
you know, I'm keeping my business open as I've been vocal about, as I've made videos about, because I don't feel like I should have to hide the fact that I'm earning an income to pay my mortgage and feed my children. I don't have to hide that from anybody. And the solution is overwhelmingly simple. If you don't want to come into my gym and work out, then don't. You know, I've talked about it on the show before. The Washington State Department of Health, through their contact tracing, has traced zero cases to health and fitness facilities. Zero. But then Inslee says, we're going to follow the science and we're going to shut down health and fitness facilities. And I can't wrap my head around that. And I don't think anybody can. And it gets to the point where you're like, okay, this is agenda driven at this point because it's blatant lies. They're telling us absolute bullshit. And then they're forcing everybody to shut down. And why are they doing that? And I go back and forth on that as well. I don't really know why I don't, you know, there's, there's all kinds of theories out there, but what is really going on and why are they doing this to people? It's not about safety. If it was about safety, we wouldn't see Newsom going out to dinner with all his friends inside some restaurant with no mask on. He knows, he knows as well as everybody else knows it's not about safety. And it's the same thing with all of them, with Pelosi getting her hair done. And uh, there was, I forget her name off the top of my head, but there was a city councilwoman in Los Angeles who was one of the people that brought the vote to the table to close all restaurants in Los Angeles County. So that was her baby. And she voted to shut down all the restaurants and it passed. And then that night she went out to eat in a restaurant and she was seen and there's pictures of her. And so her thing is like, well, I wanted to go out one last time because we decided the lockdown didn't, wasn't going to take place till the following day. What? Shut the fuck up, you cunt. Like, and now you see why everybody is just fed up. You know, you can't say that restaurants are so dangerous that they all need to be shut down immediately. Like the, the following day is when they got shut down. But then you go out that night. Well, I just want to go one more time. You want to go one more time? to catch a virus that's going to kill you and kill your family. Cause that's what they're, that's the picture that they're, they're painting to everybody. And so we see that happening over and over and over again. And we all know that this is agenda driven and it's not about each other or it's not about maintaining safety for our citizens. And so I've had enough people in my life over the last say two months that have, I've gotten contact with. I have, uh, I've met with some people, I've sat down that are intelligent, they're prestigious, they're, they're, they're not living in fear and they're just thinking about employing a more prepared mindset. And enough people have come to me, people that I look up to, people that I, that I have trust in, people that are just overall winners, they're doing well in life, that it makes me realize this isn't, this isn't me being out in, in left field on the fringes. This is a concern that is sweeping across the country and a lot of intelligent and high functioning human beings that are successful across a wide spectrum of life are in the same position that I'm in thinking, man, what is about to happen? And so when you hear that stuff from obviously, like I said earlier, I'm having this talk in my own head all the time. But when you see other people that you put a lot of weight into their words saying the same thing, it'd be foolish to not listen to that voice. And it goes back to like what I've been telling people from the beginning. If we want to feel prepared, and I feel preparedness is the antidote to fear. It's easy to feel scared. And, and, and I feel like that's what the left is doing. Every comment I read is, well, if you don't have your mask on, you're going to get sick. And if you don't, if you don't close your business, people are going to die. There's already been this many deaths. It's easy to get consumed by fear. And I feel like preparedness is the antidote to fear because the more capabilities you have as an individual or as a small community, the less you're concerned about all this exterior shit the less you're concerned if things go bad because they might go bad, but we'll be okay. And if you know we'll be okay, 
Guess what? Fear doesn't have the ability to control you like it does if you don't have that preparedness and that mindset behind supporting a future where you will be able to take care of yourself and your family. And so, you know, we could circle back to, like I said, with when I was on with Mike Glover, shoot, move and communicate. Those are the three elements right now that I think really will help people find a sense of calm and a sense of community and, and be able to put to rest those feelings of, un, of unease because if you have those abilities, then you will be able to function in a, in a environment that is non-permissive, that is dangerous, that is scary, that is violent. All of those things can be mitigated if you're prepared. And so let's talk about those again. Shooting. The funny thing is shoot, move, and communicate is something that we used to scream in basic training. It's the foundational principles of combat. And everybody focuses on shooting. And I'm not saying that shooting is bad or it's not necessary, but just like any, I mean, it's a three-legged stool and you, you take one leg out and it no longer stands. So you can be the best shot in the world and you can have all the Gucci gear and you could, your Instagram can be full of badass battle vests and, and 6.5 Creedmoor rifles that cost $10,000. And, and trust me, I think all that stuff's cool too. I'm not knocking it, but it's only one tier of the, of the program. And so I think shooting is important, but I also think, and, and with shooting comes, it's all encompassing of tactics of, uh, learning how to, do battle drills, knowing how to clear a bunker, knowing how to flow into a room, something as simple as flowing into a room and all that stuff is necessary, but I'm going to tell you this, this is something that you should think about. If you train that stuff, the only way that it will ever work is with, is if you're with the same 10 guys and you rehearse those drills a thousand times. You know, when I was in Ranger Regiment with my squad, I could go through a building and it felt 100% natural. It, it, there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't a lot of confusion. I mean, in, in CQB environment, there's always going to be some confusion. So I'm not going to act like we were the CAG guys taking down buildings. There's going to be some confusion. There's going to be, uh, especially if you're doing multiple entries or multiple uh, entry points, I should say, simultaneously. Different things can make it become really confusing. But one thing that I found is when you work with the same group of guys and you rehearse things over and over and over and over, now it starts to just almost take on a life of its own. The flow, you, you all get in a flow state together where you understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. You understand I'm an, when I move right, you move left and, and everything just starts to kind of come together. And this was in the Ranger Regiment. And I love the Ranger Regiment, but we are the babies of the special operation community. As you as you grow older and you start to work your way up to the more high-speed units, those guys are like surgical in their building takedowns. But when I got out of the Ranger Regiment, I joined the Los Angeles Special Response Team with the Marshal Service. And it felt like I was starting over again. It was actually, I, mean, I remember feeling embarrassed and I, I've never talked to anybody about this. So if any of my old homies are listening, they'll probably laugh. But we had a we had a state-of-the-art mount facility for the Marshal Service down in LA. It was really cool. They had a gigantic building with uh, several floors. But the cool thing about this facility is the walls moved and you could rearrange it and you could change the positioning of the doors. You could change the positioning of the entry points. And so you'd have a cadre or someone who is taking the cadre position for the day, go in there and reconfigure the building. And then you have to take it down again. So you don't know what to expect. And I remember feeling like, okay, I know I understand the fundamentals of CQB, but I've never done it with these guys before. And there's a lot of anxiety around that. And it, it felt off to me. And I remember when that shifted, we were doing CQB training at this facility and me and one of the guys, and his name's Mark Dale, shout out. I don't know if you remember this or not, Mark, but you pulled me aside and you said, Hey, do you and I 
just a two man team want to hit this building like 15 times in a row and take the whole thing down. And there wasn't, um, I mean, you're not going to take a big building down with two guys. It's not very tactical, but just to get the reps of moving through hallways, flowing, uh, clearing corners together and, and, and dead spaces and all the stuff that you do do as two men, we did that. And at the end of that, it kind of, it kind of started to, I felt like, okay, me and this guy are starting to understand each other. And then we incorporated the whole team and we hit that building over and over and over. And by the end of that day, I was like, okay, I, I feel good with these guys now. And the interesting thing about that is it's a group of guys that already knew what they were doing. So my whole point of that rant is even if you have guys that are Rangers or seals or Marines that have been in the fight before and understand these things until you all get together as a team and hash that out amongst yourselves and go through those drills as an operational element, it won't feel right. There's a 0% chance that I could link up with a couple guys off of Instagram and have any type of success taking a building down. It's just not how it works. And so while the shooting tier is important, and I think it should have a, a certain amount of emphasis, I'm to the point now where I think move and communicate are what are going to have the potential to make or break anything that is uh, any of these operational elements that do find themselves in violent encounters in the future. And move... That tier means mobility, the ability to get from where you are to where you want to be on a timeline that is reasonable for your operation. And that could mean vehicle. That could mean by foot. It can mean anything. You can take a fucking horse if you want. But as long as you're getting where you need to be by the time you need to be there, that's good. But the thing about move that a lot of people forget is move encompasses your health and your fitness. And that is why it is one of the absolute priorities of being combat ready. If you can't move, you can't fight, period. And, and it's interesting how people don't think that that's as important as it is. Uh, if you can't walk 25 miles, you're not going to be a good soldier, period. Because once if things do just go to complete shit and it's Mad Max and you're out of fuel, guess what? Now you're on your, your LPCs, your leather, leather personnel carriers. And it's an important thing to reiterate and remember that if you want to be competent in any type of combat scenario, your health and your fitness is everything. And so I see, again, you know, these, uh, and I'm not trying to say like disparaging comments about people, but I'm just simply stating observations. You see these rallies where... Patriot movements come to combat the Antifa movements. And now you have these two groups of people. It's like a, a Mexican standoff and everybody's standing, looking at each other. But a lot of the guys look obese. Their body armor's squeezed on at the, the last possible setting. And I look at them and I think, okay, I know you like the idea of being ready for combat, but your physique tells a different story. And I mean, I could go off on a whole tangent on that because I don't think it's tactically sound to put yourself in the middle of a crowd with an AR-15 in a tumultuous situation that may erupt and go violent. You don't want to be standing out there. So the, that also tells me all those people out there doing that, they're probably not the people that I want to be aligned with if things go bad. It's tactically unsound. I mean, I, I can't think of a time when we were deployed when you would just go stand out in the middle of an intersection and be confrontational with, with a potential enemy, that's not how you do business. And so it just seems like in, instead of people that ha having, uh, as opposed to them having a combat mindset, it's almost like they just want to be confrontational. And I get it guys. I'm not saying that I don't trust me. I get that. But at the same time, we got to be playing smart here. We need to be playing chess while they're playing checkers. And I just think that there's a better way to go about things because this is what I think as far as things going South, you know, there will be an incident or there will be a series of incidents where it is no longer up for discussion. It's time for action. And I don't know what that incident will be. And I don't know when it will happen, 
But that's kind of my mindset. I think that that is going to happen. And then you're going to know it's on. Okay. It's no longer up for discussion or for interpretation. And once that moment happens, okay, now let's start to rally at our pre-designated points. Let's start communicating with our fire team via ham radios. Let's make sure everybody's women and children are safe. Let's get everybody in a, a safe location. And then let's be defensive or depending on the situation, maybe we do that and then we have to be offensive and it's going to be met T, you know, it's going to be determined by what's going on in the situation. That's a nerdy military acronym. It stands for mission, enemy, terrain, troop, time. And it's just taking all of the variables on the battlefield and analyzing them and then determining how we act in response. And so the last thing is just communication. And I think, um, I think that's probably the most lacking of anybody's preparedness because once your cell phone doesn't work anymore, I think 99% of Americans are going to feel like they're in a black hole. You can't type anything on Instagram. You can't text. You can't call. You can't FaceTime. Okay. Well, what do we, how do we start to have any type of communication with these people? people that we were hoping to be able to band together and and plan a successful route out of this this potentially this potential violence that is coming into our cities or whatever the case may be and so i don't think that there's a lot of like question of what needs to happen i just don't think people are doing it and you need to have radio communication and you need to have predetermined frequencies and you need to have the capability of having OPSEC pre-planned into your communication because ham radios are not encrypted. So the reality of it is if you're talking on a ham radio, other people can be listening to you. So you can't say, hey, meet at the corner of 5th and Republican. That's not an option anymore. So now you're going to have to say, I mean, whatever, whatever you want it to be, meet it at predetermined checkpoint one or whatever it is. And that's how we're going to have to start to communicate. And you can get the, the, like, like Mike Glover talked about the little Baofang hand, handheld radios on Amazon for 50 bucks or whatever, just to have something. And that's what I have right now. Or you can go and spend as much as you want. I'm actually thinking about buying a more just a more robust model that has a, a better range, better battery life, and uh, it's waterproof. And just a, I mean, it's this radio is three hundred dollars, and uh, I don't. Yeah, it's it's about five times as expensive as the other one. But at the end of the day, if we need this equipment, you're going to hope that you spent the money to have the right thing when that time comes. And so. You know, I think when, when all this stuff pops off, and like I said before, I think it's an inevitability at this point, you're going to wish that you took some of the steps that I find myself taking now, just in case. It might be worth a few thousand dollars of equipment, just in case. And even if it never happens, the peace of mind, knowing that if it does, it's really going to benefit your your family and your children and your community to have some of these things that you know, we're war gaming in our heads and, and we've pre-planned some stuff and that can make you rest and, and just take a breath and, and decompress a little bit. But that's what I found. I mean, that was my whole therapy session is that part of me is so focused on combat preparedness that I'm having a hard time finding any type of harmony with the other side of my brain that does just want to drop my ruck and order a pizza and relax. And uh, she said something interesting to me. She said, why don't you try and build a person that, that has the traits of a warrior that you admire and that you think are necessary, but then that a person that can also sit down and relax and enjoy himself and have fun and not, and, and not have to be focused on what ifs all the time. She said, that person can be one person. You can build that person 
who stands somewhere in the middle between the two of you, and you can step inside of that person. And now you can start living in a manner that is beneficial, more beneficial to you. And I just thought that was interesting because I think that's what we all want to do. But I also think it's a lot easier said than done. It's easy to start getting pulled back one way or the other. And I mean, that's me as a person. I'm peaks and valleys. I'm really fucking good or I'm really fucking down. And very rarely do I just feel myself hanging out in the middle, feeling neutral. I I joke sometimes, fuck neutral. Like, I don't want to be there. If things are good, I want to be excited about it. I want to be fucking stoked. But if things are shitty, I want to feel that emotion. Like, things are bad. This is fucked. Like, how do we fix this? I like those peaks and valleys. And I think they've served me pretty well for the, the last 40 years. But maybe at some point, I do need to start to figure out how to find some kind of peace in the neutral area. And so, you know, driving around Seattle today, it was kind of interesting. Uh, one of my followers on Instagram saw that I was down there. He hit me up and he's like, hey, can you stop by the Space Needle? I'd love to have a picture with you. And I was right there. And uh, I said, dude, I'm right here. I'll, I'll literally stop and meet you right now. And I did. And uh, I talked to him for about probably five minutes. And he works um, at one of the local hospitals. And I didn't ask him what he did. I mean, I didn't start to get into his life story. But he told me, he's like, you know, it's interesting is like, the hospitals aren't struggling right now. Like, like you keep hearing everywhere. That's not really the case. So, and, and he wasn't even trying to like promote an agenda or talk about how fucked up the left was. None of that stuff. It just kind of came up in conversation. Cause he's like, yeah, I work at the hospital up the road here. And, and I was like, yeah, how's, how's that been? And he goes, you know, it's, it's a normal, it's a normal year. It's the same. It's, it's, kind of what you would expect for this time of year. And I thought that was interesting because I've heard other people saying that, that the winter hospitals do experience higher numbers. And I feel like everybody's freaked out about that right now. And maybe that's just part of it. Maybe that's just part of people getting sick seasonally. I don't know. I I always say I'm not a doctor. I'm not an epidemiologist, but there's certainly narratives being pushed that just, just, Two and two doesn't equal four. It's it's a weird it's a weird thing that we're experiencing as a society right now, and so, you know, driving around Seattle again, I saw a lot of homelessness. I saw a lot of stuff that was just made me want to get out of that fat that city faster than I got there. But it made me start to it made me start to just feel that stress again, like we're being let down. Our community leaders have failed us. Look at this once beautiful city. And and then I got home and I opened my phone and one of my friends sent me a text message. And, and it's just, I feel, I swear to God, I feel like I'm living in a fucking simulation because every time I try and like, like I literally went to counseling this morning to try and decompress and, and figure myself out a little bit. I'm driving home and I get a text message and my buddy sent this message and it's a uh it's a thing it's it's a youtube video from a representative from detroit michigan her name's cynthia johnson and this is what she says i'm just going to play it on the air so you guys can hear this and and make your own opinions of it so this is just a warning to you trumpers be careful walk lightly We ain't playing with you. Enough of the shenanigans. Enough is enough. And for those of you who are soldiers, you know how to do it. Do it right. Be in order. Make them pay. So that's how it ends. Make them pay. Like, is that not inciting violence? I mean, she didn't just directly come out and say it, but she called people on the right Trumpers, which uh, that's her attempt at coming up with something witty and derogatory. It really just makes her sound like a fucking idiot. But then she says, we've had enough. And 
If you're a soldier, you know what to do. Make them pay. And dude, as soon as I heard that, I got sucked right back in to combat preparedness. Because if you stupid bitch think that, and you and any of your people have the ability, physically, tactically, if you think you have the ability to make me pay, whatever that means, come and fucking do it. You know, like get the fuck out of here with that shit. You're trying to incite violence when you don't have the capacity for violence. You don't know what violence is. And you want to stir the pot and encourage people to go out there and hurt other human beings inside of our fucking country. You're doing that as a representative, as a politician. It's vile. It's disgusting. I can't even believe the words that were coming out of her mouth while I was listening. And um, I don't know all the ins and outs of this. I, I read up on it a little bit, but uh, I guess the committee that she was on in Detroit, it's the, uh, the fifth, con- what, let, let, me, let me look real quick just so I don't mess this up. But she's, the Mich- she's part of the Michigan House of Representatives, District 5, which said she was out of Detroit. And so I just pulled up a couple articles. I'm like, who is this lady? Who would say that? Like, if, if you're in any type of official position and you release that message, you should be gone immediately. And sure enough, whatever committee she was on, um, it said uh, a couple, um, the House speakers, names Lee Chatfield and the speaker-elect Jason Wet- Wetworth, they had her removed from their committee for her words. And then guess what? You're going to be shocked to hear this. Governor Gretchen Whitmere came to her defense. Came to her defense. It's, it's, like, it's like these politicians. It's like you're, the, the lines are drawn in the sand and you have to blindly defend people regardless of the words that come out of their mouth, but just because of their political affiliation. And it's fucking gross. And this is what she said. This is Governor Whitmer from Michigan. She said, I think this is a woman who has been through a lot. And I think it's important for every single one of us to give one another a little bit of compassion and grace. Nothing Johnson has had, or, or she said, and noting that Johnson has had a loved one in the hospital. Oh, Someone you know is sick. So now you can just get on the internet as a leader of your community and try and incite violence against conservatives because someone you know is sick. Fuck you. It's a disgrace that that even took place. And then for her to go and defend her, it's just blowing my mind. And it pulled me right back to, you know what? Things are going to go fucking bad. And guess what? I'm going to be ready for it. And I'm not out in left field. I'm not the crazy one. She literally said, go out there and make them pay. Like she's some 62 year old bitch that thinks she has the ability to incite people to go out there and make us pay. It's just mind boggling that this is what we're dealing with. And so you know, just like that, I got all fired up. I was texting back and forth with Lappin. I'm like, dude, fuck this, fuck her, you know? And it's easy to get sucked back into that. But at the same time, I think that it's necessary. I just don't think that turning a blind eye to this kind of stuff makes any sense right now. And I'll tell you why I'm so fucking offended by it. I made a video May 5th of this year that simply said, Guys, as law enforcement officers, we got to be doing better. We don't get to trample people's constitutional rights. We don't get to take people's abilities to provide food for their family away. We don't get to shut their businesses down. We don't get to take people off the beach in handcuffs because they went surfing. We don't get to arrest women at the park because they're kicking a soccer ball with their daughter. Do you guys understand that's not how we do business? And if we continue to do business that way, it's going to get bad for us. That was my message. Pretty simple, right? Pretty honest. 
Like I wasn't trying to stir the pot. I wasn't trying to incite anything. I was simply speaking to police officers because I saw the writing on the wall. If we don't change the way we're doing things, it's going to get bad for us. And I was fired for that. I lost my fucking job for recommending that police officers support the constitution. Then you have this elected leader who's openly inciting people to go out and commit acts of violence and that's okay. And so obviously we're at an impasse here, people that side of the fence and this side of the fence will not be able to come to any type of agreement on this kind of stuff. Our morals and values are fundamentally different. So where is this going? You know, where is this going? I can tell you this. I am excited to hear over the last week. Let's see. Today's date is because I release these typically a week later. So today's date is Thursday, December 10th. If you're listening, it's probably a week later. Riverside County Sheriff openly said, Governor, Governor Newsom, I am done with your COVID bullshit. Los Angeles County Sheriff, Governor Newsom, I'm done with your COVID bullshit. And I'll tell you what, I am ecstatic to see law enforcement leadership finally standing up and acting like they have their fucking balls back. You know, I, I joked on Instagram last week. I said, hey, law enforcement leadership is standing up against these unconstitutional orders. I said, this is something I spoke about six months ago, but maybe I was just a little early to the party. My bad. And I was just making light of it, joking. But I got so many people that were like, Greg, that was a, an integral part of starting this movement. And that was something you planted the seed. And I'm not going to say I did or I didn't. Like, I had my views and I shared them and it resonated with a lot of people. But regardless if it started the movement or it didn't, there's a movement beginning now. More and more people are done. More and more people are resisting. More and more people are opening their businesses. That's another video I recently made. I opened my business, like I said earlier, overtly. I'm not going to put Visqueen on my windows. I'm not going to tell my, my gym members to go park in the grass on the other side of the parking lot so it doesn't look like you're at the facility. My response to all that is fuck yourselves, okay? My gym, I literally built it from the ground up. My buddy Darren Loth came over with his fucking backhoe and we dug the footings and we dug the foundation. We did it all ourselves. And that was in 2011. That's been my place for 10 years now. And if you think that I have to shut it down or I have to hide or I have to be low key or underground, fuck you, okay? And, you know, I've gotten a fair amount of hate from people for saying that. Like, oh, it's people like you why we're in lockdown number two. No, dummy. I agreed with lockdown one and I followed the orders in lockdown one because I, like everybody else, thought maybe this pandemic was serious. I actually shut my gym down before it was ordered shut down. And that was because, guess what? I'm an intelligent person that can look at facts and circumstances. And I, I remember telling my team, you can ask my team. I said, guys, you take a week off of jujitsu. I said, we're going to close down right now because I don't, I don't know what this thing is. And let's figure it out. And let's give enough grace to the situation that if it is potentially bad, that we're ahead of the curve and that we're not doing the wrong thing. I did that. And so I'm not opposed to saving people or helping people or curving the spread of the virus or flattening the curve. Like I get all that. We're not there anymore. It's clear as day. We're not there anymore. And so, you know, I was excited to see, uh, more and more people finally willing to take a stand. Ian Smith in New Jersey with, uh, his gym. He's been like the front runner on the East coast saying, fuck you. That bar in uh, New York what was at Max Public House, I believe it was called. The guy was taken out of there in handcuffs. Taken out of there in handcuffs for what? Like, you, you want to know the charge that they, they tried to make stick? Trespass. <laughs> 
He owns the place, you fucking morons. He own, that's his place. You can't criminally trespass someone from their own establishment. But the reason they're going with trespass is because it's kind of the law enforcement all-encompassing, hey, we got you. Trust me, as a Port of Seattle officer, trespass was pretty much what we dealt with day in and day out. That was our bread and butter. Hey, what are you doing here? You can't be here. You got to leave. Oh, you're not going to leave? Criminal trespass. And I'm not knocking that. There's people that don't need to be in certain places. And it should be up to enforce the law and get them out of there, right? Guess what? You don't get to do that to someone in their own business. So the cops that are doing that, pull your heads out of your asses, guys. It's time. It's time to pull your head out of your asses and pull the cocks of these political elites out of your throats and think for yourselves because there's going to come a time when you have to choose the side. Okay. It's the same thing I said in my first video. I understand that you're 32 years old and that you bought a new house for $432,000 and that you have a mortgage and that you have an 18 month old baby. I get all that stuff. None of that supersedes people's constitutional rights, period. Not up for discussion, not up for interpretation. So you need to make a stand and stand on the side of right. And I say this for two reasons. One, when you look back on how you conducted yourself during this bullshit era, you want to be able to hold yourself, hold your head high and have pride and integrity in who you were. And if you're doing things that you feel are outside of your moral compass, you better check yourself, okay? But the more gruesome and dark side of this is if it does ever erupt into violence, police officers need to be standing on the side of right. You need to be standing on the side of right. You don't go into somebody's house and arrest them because they have 12 people over for Thanksgiving. You don't go into people's businesses and shut them down when, they're, when their business is going under and they're broke, you don't go do that. And what's going to start happening, and I hate to say this, this is the whole point of my first video, and it's why I get fired up about it. At some point, the public will turn on you. They will. They don't have a choice. When it's their livelihoods or kissing the ass of the political elite and just letting everything, their life's work, be stripped from them when those are the two options people have guess what they're gonna do they're gonna fight for what's theirs and if you officers out there are gonna stand up for the corrupt government when that moment presents itself shame on you you are no police officer in my mind you are a fucking tyrant just like they are you know governor cuomo from new york said last week in a stupid fucking voice. If you guys, if the police officers don't enforce my mandates, then they're just being little dictators themselves. Like, go fuck yourself, dude. That's his last ditch effort. The reason he's even talking about that is because they're scared shitless of law enforcement turning on them and siding with the people. They're terrified of it. So if you're a cop and you're listening, think about this. Draw your lines in the sand and stand on the side of right. When you look back in history, when you're an old man or an old woman, you'll be able to hold your head high and know that you did the right thing when the government tried to crush the citizens of this country. Don't stand for it. And if you do decide to stand for tyranny and corruption, well, then guess what? Whatever happens, happens. And that was your choice. That was your choice. So I didn't know where this episode was going to go. And I, I'm looking down at my, my roadcaster right now and I'm at an hour, hour long rant. So, uh, you know, I'll close it with some, you know, some other things that I've been thinking about. And uh, hopefully, like I said, we'll get that guest in. Um, I'm trying to reshoot it for tomorrow. And we'll, we'll be on time for, for upcoming episodes. But I just want to say this. You know, the pandemic is the, the forefront of everybody's mind right now. And 
everybody's interpreting this pandemic differently. And some people are very fearful. Some people are saying that 300,000 Americans are dead from the coronavirus, which that's up for discussion in my mind because a lot of comorbidities are playing into effect of who's being considered a COVID death and who's not. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to give any details on the situation because it's a friend of mine, but uh, I know someone that did die and that did have COVID, but they were terminal outside of the, the COVID diagnosis. And that's the only person that I know. And so when I look at the situation, I have to ask myself, okay, the one person that I know that died of COVID, or I shouldn't even say died of COVID, died with COVID was terminal anyhow. And so how many other of the cases is that the case with? Are we, are we giving power to this thing because it is, it is very dangerous for sick people and for people that have comorbidities and that have health problems outside of the coronavirus. And I think that's what we're doing. That's my interpretation. Am I wrong? Am I right? I don't fucking know. But at the end of the day, we're in this thing a year now. I have to be able to analyze what I see, listen to people and draw conclusions. And this is the conclusion that I've drawn my pandemic. I, I can only, I can only invest energy, time, and try and create solutions for things that are affecting me personally. And so when you want to talk about coronavirus, this is what my pandemic is. The physical health of my students at the gym. Their physical health, their physical health and their ability to maintain their physical health. The one thing that nobody is discussing in relation to this pandemic, it's just silence. There's nothing that we're hearing is that the biggest factor that can help you beat this virus is your health and your fitness. That's the number one thing. Work out, train hard, have a, have an appropriate body composition, eat nutritious foods. Okay. If you do those things, it's unlikely that you will be, you will be in danger from dying of this virus. Now, are there outliers and are there exceptions? Yes. And are those tragic? Yes. I'm not trying to discredit that stuff. But overall, it's imperative that we take care of our health and that we take care of our bodies. And fuck, man, heart disease is the number one killer in America. We've been killing ourselves with food and inactivity for three or four decades now. Silence. No one says a fucking word. So why is that? They're so concerned about your health. They're so concerned that you might catch a virus that if you do catch it, there's a 99.9% chance you'll be fine. They're so concerned. They're shutting your businesses down. You can't go to school. But if you just work out and eat healthy foods, you'd probably be okay. Why hasn't there been any emphasis on that over four decades? People have been dying from inactivity and being obese at an astronomical level, and no one's talking about it. So my pandemic, I am going to encourage the members of my gym to focus on their health, focus on their fitness for not only the physical reasons that I spoke of, but the mental health reasons too, okay? I can't tell you. How many days I didn't feel like going to the gym. I was down, feeling depressed, having a a problem at home, insert problem, whatever, okay? I go train hard. I go hit a CrossFit session or I I go roll on my mats for an hour. And when I leave the gym, it's a reset button. I feel good. The endorphins are flowing through my body. My brain is happy that it just did something challenging. It feels like it's rewarded. Everything is firing better. Everything is in sync. And anybody that's listening that trains regularly, and I don't, it, I'm not, you know me, jujitsu guy, but I'm CrossFit, running, biking, jogging, yoga, any of that stuff. When that's part of your routine and that 
helps keep your body firing at an optimal level and you take that away, things go bad. The body doesn't feel right. And it's all inner, it's all intertwined. And when the body doesn't feel right, the mind doesn't feel right. And it's causing a lot of depression and mental health problems. You know, I've, I've been open about losing teammates to suicide and I'm not going to try and tie this to the coronavirus because the truth is, I don't know. I had two, two, two teammates kill themselves in 2019, obviously not related to the coronavirus. And my team just got word that another one of our teammates, his name was Raymond Tanner. He killed himself. It's been probably two weeks now. And I didn't talk to him. I don't know the details. And I don't know if it was related to the lockdown or not. But I can tell you this. My pandemic is my people's physical and mental health. Because that's what I see day in and day out. I'm on three teammates, all from the same team. We're a decade removed from the war and three people from the same team committed suicide. And so that's my focus. That's where I'm at. That's my reality. And, you know, like the saying goes, perception is reality. And my reality is exactly that. The last thing that I'll say that has become a focal point in my life, any of you parents out there that have children that are going to school online, I want you guys to write me. I want to hear your stories because it is ruining my middle daughter. She's eight years old. It is ruining her. I am watching her decline decline cognitively and physically and emotionally. And I don't know what the right answer is. I'm struggling here. She's basically, she's very similar to me and and who she is as a person. She likes to be active. She hates jujitsu. So she does gymnastics and she's good at it. She's a natural athlete. She likes, she's a busy body, likes to be with her friends, likes to be at school, likes to be social. That's her. All that's been taken away. Her gymnastics is shut down. Obviously our schools are shut down and I'm seeing all these anger outbursts in her. I'm seeing her cry. I'm seeing her almost inconsolable at times, just down, just I'm seeing depression in an eight-year-old and it's scaring the shit out of me. I mean, when I was eight years old, I didn't know what depression was. I don't think I felt depressed until I was well into my 20s. Like at that age, everything's new, it's exciting, and you're just taking it all in constantly. Well, they're not there anymore as children. They're in a place, they're in a rut. It's like Groundhog's Day for them. And the truth is, I shouldn't be putting blame. I, I, I should be doing a better job as a parent. I should be engaging her differently. I should be helping her experience more things. And I'm literally brainstorming as we speak. I'm actually talking to my oldest daughter. Like, what do you think we could do? Because my oldest daughter, she's 11, but she's, a, she's an old soul. And she sees the same decline in her sister. And she's concerned about it. And it's just a lot of stuff that it's, it's just really unfortunate that an eight and an 11 year old have to deal with. It's sad. Um, the last thing I'll say is my five-year-old, I got her into private school and thank God for this school. It's, it's a Christian Academy and, uh, pastor DJ Rob or Rabe. I don't, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but he is courageous and he's doing the same thing I'm doing. They're telling him he has to be shut down. And he said, these children's mental health and their education is more important than your guys' orders to shut this school down. So fuck yourselves. Except he worded it differently. He doesn't speak like me. He's a pastor. (laughs) But it's the same message. He doesn't answer to Jay Inslee. He's going to do him. And if you want to bring your kids there and you want to have them educated, then let's do it. And, uh, I can tell you, night and day different. He only had one opening. Private schools are hard to come by in Washington State right now. He had one opening for a kindergarten slot. And we snatched it up. And my youngest daughter, night and day different. Night and day. And so, you know, we'll see where we go. There's a lot of shit that's coming down the pipe. Our children are at stake. Our businesses are at stake. Our livelihoods are at stake. And 
I think more and more people are of the sharing the same mindset than me that we are done being pushed around. We're done having our rights taken from us and our liberties trampled on. And at some point, something's going to give. And to tell you the truth, I'm kind of looking forward to it. So with that said, guys, I'm going to sign off. I appreciate you guys listening. And hopefully we'll have uh, that new episode recorded tomorrow and get keep getting you guys some good content. I appreciate all the support. Appreciate you listeners out there. And we'll talk soon.